and welcome back to another episode of Beyond the To-Do List. I'm your host, Eric Fisher, and this is the show where I talk to the people behind the productivity. This week, I'm excited to share with you a conversation I had with Michael Dietrich Chastain. He's the author of the brand new book, Changes, The Busy Professional's Guide to Reducing Stress, Accomplishing Goals, and Mastering Adaptability. And in this conversation, we're going to talk about those seven life dimensions that impact our ability to make professional and personal changes, as well as getting assistance to make those changes from outside sources. So if you're looking to make a change in your life, personally or professionally, this is a great book and this is a great conversation. So enjoy this conversation with Michael Dietrich Chastain. Well, this week, it is my privilege to welcome to the show, Michael Dietrich Chastain. Michael, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Eric. Great to be here. So you have a very interesting uh, approach to, I wouldn't say it's necessarily productivity, but it fits really well into the broad spectrum of productivity that we talk about here on this show. You talk about Mm -hmm. the psychology of business and that just, that right there mixes almost two things that in some people's minds don't go together. So Mm -hmm. can you explain what the psychology of business is? Yeah, absolutely. So if people think of the the phrase or the industry industrial organizational psychology, which I'm sure a lot of listeners are familiar with, I would say that's the that's the field that really studies the psychology of business. And the way that I that I explain it at a high level is just understanding kind of the, the human dynamic within business. So how do people and their their dynamics independently as well as how they interact with each other, how does that inform the success or failure of a system? Almost like if a business or an organization is a living, it, 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 we all we often think of it as a cog in the machine. You know, mm-hmm. the, the people are cogs in the machines, and that's very, uh, I don't know, dehumanizing maybe. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. if we think of a business as a large organism, and then all the people inside it of our, our different cells of that organism, then it matters what type of relationship those cells have with each other for each of them to function on their own, uh, but to then also function collectively. Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I love that. I love looking at, you know, a system or a business or a group of people in that way. It's a living organism, right? And I think that particularly in this time that we live in where we are in such rapid change and in so many ways, and that the projection of that pace of change is likely to get even more complicated in the years to come. Um, yeah, it's, it really is important to look at things kind of as a, as a living document, so to speak, rather than, um, a, a cog in the wheel, as you said. Yeah. So this is, this is dealing with, uh, dealing with still sounds like it's, oh man, I got to deal with that. No, this is, <laughs> this, this is the realm of how people, uh, relationships, personalities, communication, and all the friction that comes along with all of that, uh, how to work those things for the common good inside of an organization. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and I, I think that, well, not just, I think that the research shows us that, you know, there are these other components that really, you know, drive us to continue to look at a business like a living organism. Like you said, things like the research on emotional intelligence, on communication, on team performance, on leadership, you know, all these things that are, there are very human elements, but what the research shows us that if we, if we ignore them or look at them like a, you know, like a solid state system, or, a, you know, or a cog in a wheel, for instance, that we're really leaving opportunity on the table. Yeah. So you have a new book. It's called Changes. And the subtitle kind of clues you in onto what the changes are, are about. It's called mm-hmm. the uh, it's called Changes, the Busy Professional's Guide to Reducing Stress, Accomplishing Goals and Mastering Adaptability. And we've tackled uh, reducing stress goals. And I don't know that we've ever talked about mastering adaptability. So I definitely want to go there with you for a bit, but Mm -hmm. I I like that you've got all three of those things mixed in. So, yeah. Yeah. You know, I, it's funny. I had a, at a quick glance, you know, you, you might say, or listeners might hear those, those three things and think, well, how are, how are they related? Um, and what I've seen over the course of my career, working with thousands of clients, you know, in the, in the realm of human development at a, at a high level is that, you know, when we work through any kind of change, whether it's we want to increase our productivity, we want to reduce stress, we want to improve leadership, there are common elements to essentially creating change no matter what the topic is. And so that's that's essentially what the book is about. Yeah. So uh, 
honestly, who is this book for? Like, who's the ideal reader of this book? Is it somebody that's mm-hmm. in the workplace uh, at a large organization? Is it going to be helpful for somebody who's, say, a solo entrepreneur that works from home? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I would say yes, yes, and yes. Uh, the person, <laughs> so, <laughs> the person that I um, that I wrote it for was, you know, the the busy professional essentially, which is covers a lot of ground as we know, um, but someone that is, you know, high achieving, you know, looking for resources, looking for results, and is just you know, had, had a lot of stumbling blocks along the way, like can't quite figure out what's getting in their way. And so that could be someone in the corporate world that could be a solopreneur, but someone that is, you know, ready and dedicated to do the work. And I know from, you know, the other podcasts that I've listened to, uh, you know, that, that, uh, are in, are in your world that I know you agree that, uh, it really takes application of insight in order to create sustainability, sustainable change or productivity or, or whatever it is. And so this is all also for that reader, this person that really wants to apply what they're learning. Yeah, definitely. Well, and I was kind of throwing you a trick question there because uh, to get back to what we were talking about with the definition of the psychology of business, anybody who even is a solo entrepreneur is still interact. They are still a person and then they mm-hmm. are still <laughs> interacting with other people. <laughs> so relationships, communication, like it doesn't go out the window and it's suddenly just you and yourself. Although even then, if it was just yourself, you'd still have a relationship with yourself and still have to master adaptability and change for yourself in and of yourself. Yeah, there's there's so. no escaping our, our uh, personhood, is there? No. no, 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 no. As much as we might want to, sometimes it just doesn't right. happen. So I, I love right. that I, I love that you break out the book into the, the two parts where mm. uh, well, maybe I should just let you explain it. You broke it into two parts and I like that you've got it divided that way. Oh, sure. Yeah. And I'll give a little background just to kind of frame up what the, what the two parts are about. So to understand a little bit about how I arrived at, at separating the book. And so my, like I said, my entire career has been spent in, in human development and immediately out of college, I was heading toward this, this, you know, master's or PhD trajectory in industrial organizational psychology, like we talked about a few minutes ago and worked in the corporate world immediately out of college you know, it was great experience, did a lot of consulting work and a lot of, you know, account management, leadership coaching. But through that, it really triggered me to want to take a deep, deeper dive into, you know, human development in a, in a bigger way. And so I went back and got a master's in counseling and then a license as a psychotherapist and practiced in that world for a number of years and did, you know, everything from private practice to community mental health, managed teams of therapists, worked with a wide variety of, you know, issues within mental health from depression, anxiety to severe and persistent mental health disorder and really kind of ran the ran the gamut within that world. It was a great experience, learned a ton, but still had this interest in systems of people and business. So I made a pivot back to the corporate world and worked for a company for a couple of years, did a lot of training and development um, along the same lines of the topics that we train on in my company now. And then, you know, created my own business about five years ago. And like, like we've said, the work that we do is within the, the psychology of businesses. And so I give that background only to say that I've seen human beings create change in a wide variety of ways over the years. And what common question that has always come up in my career is, you know, if we want to get help, if we want to get assistance in some way, whether it's a coach or a mentor or a therapist or some kind of, you know, resource, how do I go about that? What is the, what is the difference between these various fields and and how do I decide which one is the right one for me? So the first part of the book looks at, you know, these commonalities of how we make change, like we discussed. But then the second part of the book is essentially a field guide to dissecting the difference between mentoring and coaching and therapy and a, a playbook to help people work through if they do want help, how do they decide which path to take? Excellent. So I definitely want to go to both sides of the book or both halves of the book. Uh, Mm -hmm. It makes sense naturally that we start with the first half. Uh, And even with the acronym, most people don't know that the the word change or changes, I should say, uh, the title of the book is actually an acronym for a number of the topics or – well, actually, it's not topics. What's the best way to put it? It's – Yeah, you could say um, themes of our lived experience. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So d- the different areas, uh, essentially, where these 
uh, changes uh, fall into. <laughs> and so I want to break this down a bit here and, and let's, let's stop and go through, okay, what the acronym uh, really is and do a very light touch on what each of them are. And then I think there's like okay. two or three that I think maybe are the most, um, well, let's just say applicable to me or stand out to me the most. And since it's my okay. show, I get to say that. <laughs> and, and, then, uh, and let's just go from there. That sounds great. That sounds great. So a little background on the, on the acronym piece. So I'm a big nerd and, and love acronyms. And part of the reason I love them is because as silly or as nerdy as they are, they work, they work in helping us remember things. And so when I was, you know, thinking about what will this book be about, it really started with this question of what are the common themes that I've seen in the clients that I've served over the years, regardless of of what the presenting issue was. Right. And so the way that I came up with the title of the book is it was before the book was, was uh, being written, looking at essentially an Excel spreadsheet. And I was coming up with all these various themes that I've seen and I landed on seven of them. Right. And so I had these seven words on a spreadsheet and then I thought, well, I wonder if there's an acronym for these seven. And then, so I started coming up, coming up with synonyms for each of the word and had this giant spreadsheet of words. And then finally, that's how the word changes emerged. And thankfully it's, it's the perfect name for what it's about because that's essentially what the book is about is how we create change. And so it was a little bit of a, um, kind of reverse engineering process, but in answer to your question, the acronym stands for Cognition, heart, action, nourishment, guts, environment, and spirit. And I can go into a, a short explanation about each if that's helpful. That would be great. Yes. I want to make oh, sure everybody okay. understands uh, you know, what we mean by each of those uh, words or areas. Sure. Absolutely. So cognition is essentially what we spend our time thinking about. Heart is our emotional self. Action is our habits and routines, daily, weekly, monthly, yearly. Uh, nourishment is what happens in our physical body. So things like sleep and nutrition and movement. Guts is uh, about courage. So our courage to act and be congruent with what we say we want and how we're moving toward what we want. And E is environment. So uh, the people, places and things we surround ourselves with. So this could this is not only the I like I love the quote, you're the average of the five people you spend the most time with. I think that has a ton of power. Um, so this would be that quote would be relevant to this, but not just people, but communities and and uh, workplaces and how you spend your time online. And so all these environments that we're in. And then spirit is essentially about belief systems, both non-religious and religious. So how we make meaning of the world, essentially. Great. So uh, there are so that's seven different areas or seven different letters, seven different words. I want to start with C, with cognition, um, because I think that that's one of the biggest ones. Again, for me personally, um, I think. Uh, you know, broken down inside of that section of the book, uh, we've got the victim or the master, we've got building motivation to change. And then what's your story? I'm really curious about what's your story, by the way. Oh, uh, yeah. This is a yeah, great absolutely. place to start maybe for a lot of people to kind of get their head around, uh, you know, where we're going with this. Yeah, I really am, am passionate about this idea of, of story. And, and what I mean by that is that, we all have particular ways of framing up um, our experiences, right? Good, bad, and ugly. And as as intense as those stories can be, from you know from childhood to last week, uh, the good news is is that we get to change them, right? And so what we decide a, a particular experience means can be changed. And there's a ton of power in that. And I think. Sure, a lot of listeners have heard of uh, Victor Frankl and, and Man's Search for Meaning, but I, you know, he is a great example of someone that you know has had a story and then completely reframes it into something else. And and I would say that you know he's one of the kind of psycho or grandfathers of psychology in that you know he came up with this idea that regardless of what happens in our experience, we get to choose uh, how we think about it. And so um, that's a little bit of a background around story. Yeah. And, and to give a quick personal example there, uh, and this might even tie back into uh, the victim or the master a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, so my story uh, was that I experienced, and, and this is also my father's story, really. My father uh, was a 
an entrepreneur and mm-hmm. he stayed at home. He had an office in the home, much like I do now. And he would, but, but the problem was, is that as a kid, I always looked at him and I would see that what he was doing for his entrepreneurial job was one, not making us a lot of money two mm-hmm. stressing him out constantly. And then three, not really giving us a relationship with him. Mm, so wow, then, yeah. So then if we take that, so it is also my story because I was observing that. But then if I take that forward and I, and I realized this, I don't know, five, seven years ago now, uh, suddenly it's like, wait, why do I have this aversion to entrepreneurs or being one? And I suddenly realized it's because I felt like we never had money that my dad, it always made my dad stressed and that he wasn't going to have a relationship with us. And that, and I didn't want any of those things. And I thought that's how it had to be. Yeah, that's, that's, that's powerful. And I think that's the real opportunity. You know, I'm really passionate about this idea of of critical evaluation, right? Like when we, when we have a story or, or really any, any idea or challenge, like the opportunity is to really dig in and, and exactly like you, like you shared, like, why am I having this experience and really unpacking it and looking at, looking at it from, you know, multiple angles. Uh, I think this, this critical evaluation is really, a uh, there's a lot of riches in it. Yeah. So I, I thought that was a good place to maybe start. I do want to say this though. Uh, there are all these different areas. And so somebody might be saying like, kind of like, how I'm saying we started at C with cognition. We don't have yeah. to start there per se. It's it's really more about self-awareness and going where you maybe feel. I know one of the words is guts, but where you feel mm-hmm. with your gut that uh, mm-hmm. there's an area sticking out like a sore thumb because of it's a pain point in your life. Yeah, exactly. And one of the things I've observed, certainly in my own life and in the clients that I've served over the years is that, you know, looking at this, this seven area matrix that what needs our attention in one period of our life may not in, an, in another period. And so, you know, it might be that, you know, right now I have, you know, some serious work to do on my emotional self. And then in a couple of years, it might be that I'm so wrapped up in my business that I ignore my, my physical self care. So I really need to dive into nourishment or, you know, the belief systems that I have really aren't serving me anymore. So I need to, you know, really take a microscope to those. And so I think that where, you know, what needs our attention in any given day or, or phase of our life can really change depending on where we are. So really, there's no one place to start for everybody. It's always going to be, you know, contextual to their story. Yeah, absolutely. That, that was one of the things I really wanted to emphasize in this book is that I, you know, I'm, I'm much less interested in giving like a, 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 a direct recipe for success and more so a choose your own adventure book, right? Because everybody is so different and unique and everyone has unique stories and backgrounds and, and lived experiences. And so this book I see is more of a, of a toolkit to say, okay, here are these seven dimensions. We know that they impact our, our experience, our success in a variety of ways. And there's a ton of research to support that, but what needs our attention is going to be based on, on the individual and, and also what they're ready to examine because, you know, as we know, it, it's, it's sometimes hard to take a look at, you know, the, the less shiny parts of our, of our lived experience. So let's go back to cognition real quick. So sure. not only kind of took a, a, a U-turn uh, or, we, you know, <laughs> went, we went down a side road. We're back now. It, we're back in cognition. <laughs> so we talked about the story. Uh, what else do we need to know in terms of uh, cognition? I mean, is cognition uh, another word for you to mean like self-awareness? It's more about um how I choose to think. So the first chapter is about this idea of, of victimization versus mastery. And I think this is a really good example of how cognition plays out. And I'm, I'm really fascinated by this, this concept of, of self victimization. And I'll give a little, a, a little caveat before going down this road, which is, you know, I, I don't mean to say that we aren't victims to the, the hatred and cruelty and, and chaos that is in the world. Those are all real things. And so I don't want to downplay any of that because there's a lot of pain in the, in the world. And this idea that um, we can take on a mentality or a, or a cognition, a way of thinking of victimization is really disrupting to what we want to create oftentimes. 
And so if, for instance, if we spend all of our, all of our day thinking about, you know, the barista got my drink wrong or my boss yelled at me or I got a flat tire or I got home and dinner wasn't ready. And the, all of this focus on negativity and, and victimization, it talk about it, talk about a disruptor to our, to our productivity, you know, because what we choose to focus on really expands, uh, where we spend our time. And so it's a, it's a, it's a real risk, I think, in holding this mentality of victimization. Does that make sense? Yes, totally. Yes. Got it. So then let's flip that. What does the master have to do with that? Why is, uh, you know, what's, how is that a, a polar opposite of being the victim? Yeah. So I think that's, that's always this choice that we have, right? Is do I choose to take on the identity of a victim or do I choose to take on a a position of mastery? And it's, and it's really just a, again, a a shift in mindset. And so, you know, the the silly example of, you know, the barista got my, got my drink wrong. I asked for an Americano and she gave me a mocha or whatever it is. It's like, instead of going down this path of, you know, how frustrating it is and how disrupting it is. It's really just a simple shift in, you know what, I got to have a coffee today and I have the money and resources to do so. And, you know, I get the extra time away from work. And so there's just a, a, and it's a silly example, but just a simple shift in how we choose to perceive situations can go a, a long way. And if you think about the amount of times over the course of the day, we're given the opportunity to either choose victimization or mastery, it really adds up from a time standpoint. So if you want to compare that to productivity, if you position yourself in the position of mastery, you know, I, I haven't done the, the research to determine what the time allocation would be, but I would venture to guess over the course of a day, you'd be, you know, you'd be looking at maybe an hour plus of additional time, not focused on what's going wrong. Oh, I, I would actually argue it was maybe higher than that because yeah, yeah maybe. I mean, it, yeah. it's because of how, um, it's, it's an, we just had, uh, uh, near a all on, and we talked about indistractable, which was dealing with these internal external as well. But mainly for me, the biggest thing from that was internal distractions. And this is, mm. this would be a major one. It is based on Absolutely. your perspective of feeling like you've been wronged at every turn, you know? Yeah, exactly. And, I, and I'll take it a step further for folks if they want to actually, you know, take an application away from this conversation. This is a tool that, that we'll use often with our clients and it's, and it's simple, but it's tracking and experimentation. And so, you know, as we're talking, Eric, you know, this idea, is it an hour and ex- extra time a day? Is it five hours extra a day? You know, it, it could be very unique to the, to the individual. So the opportunity I would say could be over the course of a 24 hour first track, how often we're in the position of, of victim, right? And maybe it's just at the end of the day, kind of recalling amounts of times, or maybe it's, you know, you keep your phone or your journal with you throughout the day and you're tracking. And then that can create first a baseline to say, okay, you know, I'm, I'm either often in the position of victim or may, maybe not so much, but it gives people kind of a baseline to see where they are. And then after they have that baseline, then just begin to experiment, you know, even if it's in a small way, maybe two to three times a day when you can disrupt yourself in that victimization mindset. Mm. And then that can be tracked over time. And and in my experience, tracking, journaling, experimenting over time can create a a big ripple effect. And in this case, put someone in a more regular position of the master, so to speak. Gotcha. Okay. All right. Let's move on to another uh, area here. So in, in, in light of this being a productivity show, I think the word action is probably a great place to go. Uh, and mm-hmm. it heads up the next one I want to do because we've tackled that a lot and it's also applicable to me is, nourish, is nourishment. So ah. uh, let's go with action first, though. So the best way to improve productivity <laughs> caught my eye immediately <laughs> I <thought laughs> when I was so. flipping through the book. So let's start there. Sure. Sure. So similar to, you know, what we were saying before around you know, this, everyone is unique, you know, it's kind of a, it's kind of a, you know, a, a jokey title because the best way to prove, improve productivity, in my experience is based on that individual's current situation, you know, their life circumstance, their work, you know, their history. And so again, I circle back to experimentation, you know, it might take, and in, certainly in my own life and in the clients that, that I've served, it might take experimenting with different different ways in order to determine which one is my way. And essentially that's always going to be, you know, the best way, or at least that's been my experience that there's not a, a silver bullet, so to say for everybody. 
Yeah, for sure. And again, that's why that's why I have a job doing this show because there's right, right. so many different again, kind of like you're talking with all the different uh areas in the acronym, but also mm-hmm. the, even inside of each of those different areas, there's different approaches, there's different needs, and so yeah, there's no there's no silver bullet. There's no, no one right way for a lot of these things. So Yeah, and and I and I'll add the element that I think this is also opportunity left on the table oftentimes, which is looking at how our different aspects of our lived experience influence for, in this case, our productivity, right? So not just looking at, you know, our actions and habits and routines, but, you know, how we think and and how we nourish ourselves and our belief systems and all of these things really influence our, our productivity. So I think that's kind of a, it's kind of a counterintuitive way to look at it that, you know, or at least for me, like when I think productivity, I do think action, I think Mm -hmm. habit, right? And oftentimes it's, it's not just the habit, but it's about all these other things that influence our habits. Totally. Yes. And and obviously habits is one of the things we've talked about on this show before. So there's other, you know, maybe I'll link up to some, some of those episodes in the show notes for this one. Um, yeah. But one of the things that I want to mention here is I agree with you totally that, uh, you know, the word action makes you think of productivity and, you know, productivity being producing and producing a lot. That's that's mm-hmm. where a lot of people's minds go when it comes to the word productivity. But productivity is also as much about how much you're acting and all that encompasses that to make the right decisions on what to act on. But it's also about mm-hmm. what not to act on. Right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. I think, you know, one of the fun exercises we'll do um, is this exercise called a time audit. Have you heard this before? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so for, for folks that are listening that haven't, I, you know, it's, it's real simple, but it's basically just looking at, you know, how we're spending our time in a 24 hour period, for instance, and looking at, you know, 15 minute increments to, to you again, come up with a baseline to determine, you know, how am I actually, you know, you know, spending my time over the course of a day. And every time I've done it, every time I've encouraged clients to do it, there is always a big bit of awareness that comes from it. Because I think oftentimes we, we either have a misconception of how we're spending our time or an overestimation or underestimation. And, uh, you know, when you really, when you really evaluate it, there, there are surprises. Totally. Yeah. It's never, it's never accurate when I actually take a Mm -hmm. little bit closer look and, you know, ideally it's that I'm spending more time on something than I should, but maybe in a good way, I, you know, hopefully, but usually not. (laughs) So, (laughs) but it's always, I mean, it's a recalibrate, it's a recalibration that that can happen there because again awareness so yeah yeah absolutely perfect. okay absolutely. let's move on let's move on to uh to nourishment and obviously this is the one that deals with uh with essentially self care right yeah absolutely that's it you know i i frame nourishment in the context of you know nur- nutrition sleep and movement essentially but yeah i would say self care as a as a heading is perfect um the other thing that I, I talk a lot about in the book and we see the evidence in the work that we do as well is meditation and mindfulness practice mm-hmm. there's a ton of research to support um that initiative as it relates to you know, stress reduction and productivity and focus and all sorts of other good benefits. And so that's, that's also in there. Yeah. And that ties into me with what we were talking about earlier with the, the victim and the cognition, Mm. because meditation on the nourishing side of things is going to make it more easy to, uh, (laughs) I mean, this is such a simplified and kind of a cop out way to say this, but go back to that, you know, the barista got your coffee wrong. You're not going to you're not even going to go down the road of becoming a victim, because if you've practiced mindfulness with meditation, like you're just not going to even go there. You're you're kind of or at least not ideally or actually, let me put it better. You may have the thought and immediately say, oh, I acknowledge that thought, but that thought's not true and then move on. Yeah, that's a great, I love that. That's a great tie in. And it's a great example of how these kind of themes interplay with each other. And, you know, in speaking to this idea of, you know, what's the best way for each individual, I think meditation falls in that category as well, because there's so many really interesting ways to meditate. You know, you've got you know, seated meditation and, you know, meditation lying down, transcendental meditation, Qigong, you know, Tai Chi, all, all of these other really, you know, interesting ways to do it. And so again, I think for people that have, don't have exposure to it or have had limited exposure, you know, it's, there's a lot on the menu. And so I would just encourage people to experiment. Yeah, for sure. So, okay. Uh, let's see in nourishment. If there's anything else I'm thinking of here, I just want to make sure, 
Um, but again, you know, we, we talk about this all the time and, you know, being aware of your body, being aware of the health, uh, you know, obviously we've, t- we've had, we've had episodes on sleep, not one recently though. So that I'm going to have to revisit that topic. Um, mm. but, and, and even meditation to a point has, has barely been touched on in, in this, this show. So, uh, definitely need to come back to that. So this is almost, I mean, I'm almost kind of going through the book. I'm like, oh, you know, like I need to, these are checklists of, I need to cover these topics again. <laughs> there you go. I could give another really interesting, uh, snippet about meditation if yeah, you like. Definitely. So there is, um, there's a device that we'll use with our clients that is always a, a big hit. And this would be, in, in my experience, particularly helpful for people that don't have much exposure to meditation. And it's called the Muse. Have you heard of this before? I have heard of this. Yeah. So for, for folks that are listening, it's essentially a, a biofeedback machine. So you wear it as a headband and it associates with an app on your, on your phone or tablet. And in real time, it gives you feedback about how active or calm your mind is while in meditation. And over time, you've got this really robust data set of how through meditation, you've been able to calm your mind over time. And so what I think is so fascinating, we hear this from clients all the time too, is that you know, when, when you meditate, when you're just sitting or you're doing some kind of practice, that immediate feedback isn't there. And so this tool allows for that. And so I think that, you know, again, for people that don't have much experience, it can be a way to um, increase engagement. It can be a way to increase, you know, the consistency in which someone practices. And again, just gives them a little bit additional information that they wouldn't get otherwise. It almost seems to me like it's a a heart rate monitor, but for exactly, you know, like your brain, basically. Exactly. Brain That's waves. it. That's it. They actually have, a, I haven't tried this yet, but they have a um, kind of 2.0 version that I think does also look at heart rate in addition to the, the brainwave analysis piece that it does. And so I haven't gotten that one yet, but I know it's available. Yeah. Okay. Let's jump over to the other half of the book. And again, if you wouldn't mind, let's differentiate the two halves. So what we just talked about was all about the acronym of changes. And the second half is less to do with you in and of yourself and has more to do with, uh, you getting the right help, uh, through the help of others. Yeah, that's exactly right, Eric. And, and, you know, I'm a really big believer in getting assistance. You know, I think oftentimes we carry, the weight uh, of our lives longer than we need to, you know, and, and the good news is, is there are so many educated and experienced and talented resources out there. Again, whether it's a therapist or a coach or a mentor or, uh, you know, some some a wise guide of sorts, uh, there's there's a lot available to us. And so essentially the second half answers this question of, you know, so I'm a consumer and I want to get a coach or a therapist or a mentor, or what, what have you. How do I decide which one is right for me and how do I go about choosing which one? And again, it's based on this, that exact question that I've gotten probably thousands of times over the course of my career. How do I go about deciding on a helping professional? Right. Well, and you've named a couple of different titles there. And, you know, for some people, they, they've heard these thrown around. Uh, maybe we can differentiate or, or help differentiate uh, between these different roles uh, or. Sure. Or, you know, so first off, and especially because, uh, again, we're talking about the psychology of business. And so some of those feel like, oh, yeah, that has to do with business. And then yeah. like therapist mm-hmm. doesn't nece- that feels more like uh solo individual. Not it doesn't necessarily have to do with with, you know, my workplace having that happen. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. There's um in my experience, there's a lot more. uh intersection of the work than there is separation, but there is definitely some separation. And so uh, the way that I explain it at, at a high level is that therapy is about resolving a pain and coaching is often about um, optimization of some kind. And that could be in business and in, in leadership. I think coaching and business are often connected, um, but it could be, you know, life coaching. It could be fitness coaching. Right. Um, but, yeah, there's there's in the coaching world at the high level, uh, much less about pain resolution than in a therapy world. Gotcha. OK, so, yeah. And that's been my experience, too. Like a coach is somebody who's there to say, like, here's what you're doing right. Now, how can we build on that? Exactly. It's not really about, I mean, they, although I think they do sometimes identify like, hey, like this is all what's going right. But here is this one thing that like if you were to change that, you'd, you'd be able to do so much more. 
Yeah. And, and, you know, the other thing that's interesting, and this is this is a little bit into the weeds, but for folks that, that have interest, you know, coaching is a little bit kind of the wild, wild west right now. Right. It's not regulated. Mm. It's it. There's really you don't need a you, know, you can you can hang a shingle, so to speak, or, or say that you're a coach really anytime you want. There's no regulation on it. Whereas the world of therapy is highly regulated. There's state licensures that are necessary and there's specific disciplines within the world of therapy. And so, um, you know, and again, there are advantages and disadvantages to either, but I, I think that's an important thing for the consumer to know that when looking at either, just understanding what's, you know, what's regulated and what isn't. Well, and that's, you know, hence the phrase or the term, uh, licensed therapist. <laughs> right. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. That's it. <laughs> I've never heard of a licensed coach before or a, yeah, or yeah, a coaching. licensed mentor. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Coaching as it stands right now, you know, the, the ICF, which is arguably the largest, you know, coaching entity, the international coach federation, you know, they're doing a good job of setting up kind of you know, hoops to jump through, so to speak. And, you know, you can get a certificate as a coach and there's levels of certificate that you can get based on experience and based on amount of hours you've been spending and then um, based on some testing as well. And so they're they're following kind of a similar trajectory as the therapy world. And so I wonder in, you know, in 10, 20 years, what the what the industry of coaching might look like. Yeah. Now, mentor, mentee, even relationship is less of a uh, a formal one, right? Like that's more of a uh, a partnership or an agreed kind of uh, uh, I, the the word apprenticeship almost comes to mind. Yeah, I would agree. I love that. I think that's a, I think that's a great descriptor. I throw in mentor into the mix because a lot of what the the part two of the book is about is really helping the consumer ask questions of themselves to determine what is the best fit for me and and. It, to the research, you know, that the research shows us that one of the best predictors of success in an engagement, whether it's, you know, an engagement with a helping professional, whether it's coach, therapist, mentor, one of the best predictors is goodness of fit, goodness of fit between the client and the professional. And so, you know, I'm a big believer in, in really evaluating that on the front end. And so I, the tools and, and resources in this part two of the book would apply to deciding goodness of fit for a mentor, even though it is a little bit different. And the way I would differentiate it, like you said, you know, an, an apprentice, you know, looking at who's someone maybe within my industry or area of interest that could act as a guide as I continue to develop. And if I'm not mistaken, it's also often maybe subject matter related or maybe niche related. Like it's, it's more, you know, it's not, it's not like a life coach that, you know, asks and, you know, talks all about your whole life. It's like, uh, it's more, Hey, mentor me in this specific area. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You could say niche related, you know, the, the whole idea of mentoring, uh, is also becoming a lot more popular in corporations as well. You know, the unveiling of, you know, massive mentoring programs, and to look at that from a, from a business perspective, you know, there's a ton of value in this kind of transfer of knowledge as we, you know, we have older professionals kind of retiring out and then mentoring younger ones and transferring that knowledge so it doesn't get lost, uh, you know, to the, to the ethers as we have people leaving the corporate world. There's one other term or one other uh, role, although it's not a role, it's more of a collective. Uh, it's mastermind or masterminding. Uh, oh, yeah. How does that fit in for you? Yeah, that's great. I've actually started a few masterminds in my in my city. I'm in Asheville, North Carolina, and they've been great. Um, I think there are a lot of a lot of ways to approach that, like methodologies you can have and numbers of people and processes, times to meet, all of that. But I would I would encourage similar kind of questioning of self before entering into that relationship as well. Meaning, you know, what is, what is the outcome I'm looking for? What is the group I'm looking for? What kind of communication styles are helpful for me? You know, how do, how does the thinking process of this group, is it congruent with mine or not? And so really kind of self-evaluating before entering into uh, one of those groups, I think is equally as important as it is when deciding again, any other helping professional. Gotcha. That is both sides of the book. And obviously we've barely scratched the surface because, uh, you know, obviously with the acronym of changes, uh, we did cognition, action and nourishment. So can, uh, but we left out, <laughs> we left out H for heart, uh, 
G for guts, E for environment, and S for spirit. Lots more to go down the road in, uh, to drill down in for all, let's see, four of those. I can't, I'm not doing, yes, four. We did three out of, we did three (laughs) out of seven. That's four. I, this is not a math podcast. Um, But and and we honestly barely scratched the surface with the ones that we did talk about. And then on the flip side, in the second half of the book, like there's just so much there to dig into that uh, there's just this is one of those books where everybody wants change. This is a great way to go about starting to get it. Thank you so much. Yeah, that's very, very kind. And I, I truly believe that, too. You know, again, I think that, you know, giving ourselves a tool to, you know, critically evaluate and kind of holistically examine our lived experience. If we're able to do that consistently, there are there are riches to be had, there's value to be had, and there's there's a lot of fruits to bear. And so that's my that's my invitation for for all of us. Awesome. So, Michael, uh, is there anywhere you'd like to direct people to find out more about the book or dig deeper, um, maybe, uh, you know, extra bonus content material, et cetera? Yeah, there actually are some extras right now. And so if they go to thechangesbook.com, you can actually download the audiobook for free if you'd like. I know there's a lot of audiobook listeners out there. And so you can go there. It'll also give you some additional information about the book and a little video clip and some other goodies. And so you can get that. You can also get a free workbook that looks at a number of activities to apply some of the content and more that we talked about today. So all of that is available there. And if, if people are interested in, in learning about me, uh, you can find myself at arcintegrated.com, A-R-C integrated.com. Awesome. Michael, thank you so much for being here. Great talking with you. Yeah, you too. Thanks so much for having me, Eric. It was great. Well, that's another podcast crossed off your podcast listening to-do list. I hope you enjoyed this conversation I had with Michael Dietrich Chastain. And as usual, if you wouldn't mind, do me the favor of sharing this episode with someone you know would benefit from it. You can do that by either going to the show notes at beyondthetodolist.com slash 300 or hitting the share button in your podcast player of choice where you are listening to this right now. If you're listening this far into the episode, I know that you are a true fan of the show. And so why not share your fandom with somebody else you know would be encouraged or helped by this episode? Thanks again for sharing. Thanks again for listening. And I'll see you next episode.